Recently, France has actually grabbed a lot of headlines with, uh, with the French tech movement and with the, with the tech visa and all of these kinds of initiatives. Do you want to share us a little bit of the background? Like what has led to this opening up, if you will, of the tech world? Um, yeah, sure. So I think uh, it's very interesting to ask this question because I see a lot of similarities actually between Korea and France in terms of population size, in terms of market size, in terms of business culture also in a way, because probably this uh, mindset about uh, uh, the, the risk of failure, the mindset, of, uh, the entrepreneurial mindset, etc., the lack of funding sometimes also, is uh, I think it makes the two countries very, very close. So I think there are some good lessons probably to learn from each other. Mm. So the reason why I think uh, things changed quite uh, a lot in France over the past 10 years, let's say, is that three things I think changed, um, and, and you mentioned the ecosystem, so I think people changed, so money changed, and also environment, so the regulatory uh, environment changed uh, also um, in, in a good way. So people, I think I was mentioning the mindset towards failure, I think this changed a lot. So I was uh, telling somebody at lunch that I was in a business school 20 years ago, nobody wanted to create its own uh, company. I think now if you ask the question to people who are graduate from uh, business schools, probably 30% of them would want to launch their own company. So the relationship to risk taking has totally changed. Also, we have role models now, mm. and I think in Korea it's the same. So we have a generation of uh, very successful entrepreneurs, probably in their 50s uh, something, who now became business angels, uh, and uh, who are an inspiration for the next generation, and who act as mentor, uh, financing, uh, you know, uh, uh, also new, uh, new companies. And I think these waves of innovation and these waves of entrepreneurs is also something that made the Silicon Valley so successful because there is this transmission and this ecosystem mm. sort of atmosphere. So that's, you know, the people. Uh, I think money has changed a lot also because when you look at the VC industry in France, it has become much more mature now and just have a look at the statistics. I don't have the exact figures in, in mind, but when you look at the number of rounds, the number of mega rounds, not only in France, but in Europe, so rounds above 200 million euros. You had none in 2012 and now you have like tens of them uh, in, in, in Europe. Uh, so this has changed a lot. So new money has come to finance venture. Uh, and this also was very necessary, especially at the scaling moments of, uh, of companies. And I think it's a bit the same in Korea, where uh, the, the venture capital industry is, is now also uh, developing quite a lot and brings some money to finance the, uh, the, the, the scale-ups in, uh, in, in Korea. And then I think the environment. So I was a member of government, so I really did my best to create the best possible environment from a, a financing perspective, but also tax regulation, uh, capital gain tax, this, all, all these sort of things that make the life of an investors and entre entrepreneurs better. Also try to make good regulations in, you know, for innovation and, and try to leave the state outside you know, uh, uh, decisions that could be hurdles for the, for the uh, creation of businesses. So I think these three ingredients mm. uh, made it possible that the very talented uh, uh, entrepreneurs that we have in France, but more generally in Europe, uh, I think became more successful and could really have great ambitions and, and develop uh, globally. Uh, Eric, you're uh, based out of Silicon Valley and, and Europe and, and Israel. You've seen a lot of different innovation ecosystem and entrepreneurial ecosystem. Can you kind of point us to some of the differences that you've noticed within within these regions and and I think one great point that came out last night when we were talking is differences in the approach when you're building a consumer facing business versus an enterprise solution coming from different different markets and scaling into into other markets there's a lot of stuff in this in this question but yeah can you tear it apart so today it's, it's radically transformed uh, startups are oftentimes cross-border and so global at inception. And the country that innovated the model uh, before all the others it was Israel. And they did that uh, out of necessity because it's a small country, smaller than, than Korea. They have no domestic markets. They have great technologists. They're creative. They're risk takers by culture. But they had to very quickly uh, establish a beachhead uh, very close to the market, whether it was in Europe or in the US. So in the 90s, Israel was not yet known as startup nation. Oranges and avocados and uh, tomatoes and stuff like that, but certainly not technology. 
So this changed radically, and they, they proved that you could create a young startup with uh, R&D in Israel and market-facing resources at the front end of the company near the end market. Mm. And it's even more relevant, as you suggested, for enterprise-facing companies. Enterprise-facing companies have to be global from the mindset and from implementation, because enterprise technologies are global by nature. Um, if you run a data center in San Francisco or in Paris or in Seoul or anywhere else in the world, it'll be fundamentally the same kind of architecture. Uh, you'll use the same components. You'll have the same processes. You'll be vulnerable to the same cyber attacks. So it's basically the same technology. So if you're a company that wants to help build data centers at any level that you want of the stack, you better think globally. It's very different than uh, consumer-facing businesses, which can be very, very different from one country to the other, reflecting the consumer culture preferences and so on. But the, the point about the enterprise market being global by nature forces startups to be global at inception. And uh, being global is not just uh, reflecting this on a PowerPoint slide when you build your business plan. It's about operationalizing that in terms of uh, how the different parts of your company communicate, who is going to be on your board, uh, how will you have, how, how will you deploy your resources in different countries. Mm. And today, fortunately, thanks to technologies like uh, Eric's Zoom and so on, and collaboration technologies, it's much more readily possible to do this than ever before. Exactly. Fleur, have you seen a shift in kind of the, the point in time when French companies think that, okay, we want to go global? Uh, has it, did it so during the time when you've been looking, looking at this space, both from the government perspective and now from a venture capitalist perspective, has there been a big change? Like, are, are the companies that are being built in France, are they, no, do they have a global mindset right away? M more so than, uh, than, yeah. than before, definitely. But France can be a, a bit of a trap because, you know, contrary to Israel or to, I invested in some companies that are located in Estonia, for example, mm. you have 1.3 million inhabitants. So it's a very, you have to be global if you want to succeed. France is a bit different, but it's a bit like Korea. It can be a trap because it can be a bit comfortable to say, well, I have a good addressable market. I have uh, 67 million people in France, 52 uh, million people in, in Korea. It can be comfortable to say, let's limit my business to uh, the borders of my domestic country because it's easier. Because I don't have to face other regulations. I don't have to translate it to another language. So I can totally understand that you can limit your ambitions to that. But today, it's true that if you want to go global, you have to think about conquering other markets. And, uh, and it's not easy when you're in a mid-sized country, I think. But I, I, I saw this difference in, in, in the ambition, the level of ambition, not only of French entrepreneurs, but I'm a pan-European investor, so I see that now in a, a lot of uh, the new generation of entrepreneurs who think global exactly from inception. So mm. they, they have a plan, uh, and, and it doesn't mean that they need to rush sometimes. Uh, you need to take things step after step. But this uh, global ambition, I think, is uh, uh, the characteristic of, uh, of this new generation of entrepreneurs who have great ambitions and who want to address uh, other markets, mm. definitely. Exactly. And let's now kind of move into the, move into the place which is kind of the reason for, for this session to be held in, in the first place, I think. So I'm, I'm just trying to extract as much knowledge out of you for the audience of Korean entrepreneurs, uh, especially now. So say Korea, has fantastic, fantastic technology uh, and really high quality research uh, with, within 5G and, and all different kinds of other technologies. Uh, as you said, the local market is relatively small, so Korean entrepreneurs should also have a global mindset if you want to build global winners, perhaps from day one as well. Uh, so Eric, when, say, if you're looking at a company that is being built out of Korea and that company is looking to expand either to Europe or the US, what do you think are the differences in the approach that they should take when, when thinking about the US versus Europe? Well, the way you operationalize the, the global business plan could be different. Essentially, a startup has to do three things. They have to invent and solve a, a big, big problem using technology. They have to connect this solution to the right market, the market that's uh, easiest to penetrate and big enough in size. 
and after that they have to scale. So these are three, three different phases that more or less correspond to different phases of funding when you build, build a business. Uh, in, in general, um, when you want to operate, operate this in a, in a very practical way, you have to think about who your investors should be. They have to help you go through this journey. They have to themselves have a cross-border mindset. They have to understand where you come from geographically, where you're going to. And the second is you have to think about the processes to keep your company together, even though physically it is distributed. There are tools involved, but uh, it's not enough to have tools. You have to have processes to put in place to, to, to use these tools. And the third is you have to create a culture that will bind everything together, such that when people operate in the same company uh, 5,000 miles away, they will still pursue the same goals. And, and to me, that's essential. It's uh, the, the, the processes, the, the culture, and the tools have to all fit together. And, and Fleur, let's continue with actually something that touches a little bit on, upon what, what Eric mentioned earlier about culture. So when, when going, expanding to a new market, especially to a new continent with, a, with very different cultures, what, what's the role of culture when, when thinking about global expansion for a company? In your target markets, and internally, that's kind of two specific things, but they interact. Yeah, so I agree with what uh, Eric said earlier. So that there are some businesses where it's not very important. So, you know, maybe some SaaS business, some infrastructure business, businesses are not really depending on the, the culture of consumption or mm. uh, uh, in, in the countries, but some things are really very local. Like if you're thinking of consumer goods or if you're thinking of some, some media contents, for example, uh, you know, I was uh, looking, for example, when you come to France, for example, you're a Korean company in the cosmetic or luxury uh, um, uh, business, for example. Uh, I think there are some very big differences in the way people, you know, consider luxury goods or consider uh, health or cosmetic goods. And then you need to have a very good understanding of the market uh, uh, practices and the, 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 the Consum consumption culture in, in the country, so it will really depend on the uh, on the product or the service that you uh, you want to to address. But probably when you're in Korea and you've already developed in the area, you've been used to addressing different cultures, different languages, uh, and the fact that Europe is a very fragmented market. It's not a single market yet, with a single language and a single culture and a single regulation. Maybe you know the, the experience of uh, having dealt with different cultures here in Asia can also help uh, the, the startups uh, addressing diff uh, very uh, distributed and, and, uh, and, and heterogeneous market uh, as Europe uh, is. But definitely, you, you need to make a very strong case and a very strong market study before starting to addressing B two C businesses. I think. Now going back to. Going back to Europe, and as I think we have a couple of a couple of minutes left, I'm gonna wrap up the final final topic into a simple question to to both of you. What do you think is interesting about Europe, and especially the European startup and tech scene right now? So, what interests me a lot about Europe, uh, France in particular, but uh, we're not limited to just France, is that uh, the the next phase of uh, enterprise innovation and probably consumer too is going to be heavily driven by AI and require really strong data scientists to operationalize that, uh, that innovation. Uh, <coughs> quick factoid, a great data scientist in Silicon Valley will probably cost half a million dollars to a million dollars. A great data scientist in Paris will probably cost $150,000, euros. Um, big, big difference. Same, same formal background, same quality of intellect, um, three times ratio. Uh, in many ways, what France is experiencing right now is a sort of a catch up after a lot of pent up demand. Uh, there's always been a strong educational system with math orientation in France, but not a lot of outlets for that. And now there are outlets. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think there's going to be a, a surge of innovation which is AI focused coming out of France. Uh, and locating that AI talent there is going to be strategic. And I think it'll be a, it'll be a, a good opportunity for investors to capitalize on that. Mm. 
So I totally agree about talent pool. I think, uh, uh, and we also have a, a government or a public, you know, systems that help even foreign investors, you know, hire uh, uh, and do R and D in uh, in France. So we have a, a system that really encourages R and D activities in 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 France, and it's I think it's very powerful, especially because of the war on talent that we were mentioning earlier. So I think there's a very good uh, education system. There's also a tradition of creative industries. And I think that's also in, uh, something in common with Korea. So strong uh, cultural industries, creative industries, also a strong legacy of very good industrial companies. And I'm not speaking only about France, but about Europe in general. I think the ecosystem, the tech ecosystem is just vibrant right now. I mean, the number of unicorns is now uh, something like 80. Uh, probably next year we'll have 20 more uh, unicorns in Europe. So it's really booming. Capital is uh, uh, really uh, now abundant. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, of things going on, and the, and the market is also very interesting for a Korean company. But my dream, you know, ultimately would be that we would be able to create bridges because some companies are very successful here in Korea, and you start to see very interesting unicorns. Some of them are here in the room. And my dreams would be that we would manage to create sort of alliances because. Mm -hmm it's still going to, going to be very difficult for France or for Korea on a standalone basis. I'm not speaking about Samsung, who, who is already a, a worldwide company, but for younger startups in the internet business or in the tech business, to make it against the, you know, the power of the big tech giants uh, in America or in, uh, in China, it will be difficult. And I'm, I'm sure that if we manage to create bridges between our alliances, strategic or financial alliances between very successful Korean startups, very successful European startups, Maybe we can create, you know, bigger uh, champions that can one day compete with the big tech giants. So that's my, mm. <laughs> my dream as a former politician, but also as a VC today. Exactly. The World Knowledge Forum.